Friday night, we were late to church um, because we were talking to a friend of ours. Her name is Amy. One of these days, she's going to come visit. And uh, Amy has an interesting story, and uh, I would like to sh- have her share it. But I'll share my half of the story where we met. Um, we met in 99 Ranch Market, the one on Nogales up in Roland Heights. You guys know that where that is? Uh, not Nogales. I mean, was it? Uh, Azusa, excuse me, Azusa, Azusa Street, and the 99 Ranch Market. And one of the things uh, I enjoy doing, I actually do enjoy going to supermarket sometimes. Okay, how many of you like that? Like to go to supermarket? No, you can enjoy doing that. Okay, I enjoy going to supermarket, and uh, I love these Asian supermarkets because they usually have a little aquarium in the back. I consider them aquarium. It's just a fish market, right? There's some live fish. I consider it a free aquarium. You get to go to see live fish. <laughs> and uh, I, I enjoy um, just watching them. Um, just s- some, of these, some of these tanks just so packed with the fish. And they're just packed together. And then you can just see their f- they're all just sucking air or sucking water at the same time right now. Mom, mom, mom. They're doing all that, right? You guys like that? Just I, I really enjoy watching that. And once in a while, uh, the supermarket would take out their fresh fish and put it on the table, all right, for you to kind of examine and pick them out. And, and some of the, the, the fish is still alive on that table, right? I, I know some of you may think this is kind of gross and kind of uh, kind of inhumane, but, you know, you have to kill them somehow, right? Come on. You, you have to kill them somehow before you sell them, right? Okay, anyway. So, so anyway, they, they have the, the, the live fish lying there, and, and the, most of us... Okay, <laughs> if you see fish right there, you like to check whether or not they're fresh. And how do you check whether or not they're fresh? You walk up to them. Some people like to touch it a little bit. Okay, and then, then because they're still alive, they jump, they jump. <laughs> and so you see these people jumping, right? <laughs> jumping. And I, my my favorite part is not just the aquarium, the free aquarium, but also I enjoy watching people flinching. <laughs> I like to see people's reactions. So I would just uh, position myself in a corner of. Uh, of the store, and I can where I can get a direct access, watching people coming and touching the fish, and they'll be ah <laughs> doing that, and I would just laugh my head off, right? <laughs> Having a great time. Well, what turns out was uh, there was a lady behind me watching me as I was watching people getting, you know, scared by the fish. So this lady comes in, you're kind of rude. You're laughing at people. As I. Sorry, I enjoy that. I'm coming out kind of weird, you know? So, so anyways, that's how we met. And uh, ever since we, we met, uh, we, we, we've been friends, uh, kept in touch. She came to our church a few times. Uh, we went to her house, and she came to our house. We've been friends for about eight years now. And uh, she called us this early part of this week, called Helen, and said she wanted to get baptized. So... She came and told us her story uh, about what's going on recently, how the Lord's shown her grace, shown her, you know, teaching her about her life and so forth. And one of the things that's kind of disappointing, with, but it's so true that, that she started going to some churches in, a, in, in Arcadia. I won't tell you what church it is, but some of the church over there. And, and she walked away feeling like, hey, these people got the word right. You know, they, they have a lot of the, the things teaching the Bible, and they, that, they, I believe it's from the Lord. It, it's right. But then they don't live it out. They don't live it out. And they have so much bitterness. They have so much trouble. They have so much problems. And then she says, you know, that's not right. You know, for a non-believer critiquing the church, I, I think that's right on. Hello? All right, do you get, are, are you guys hearing me? It's right on because, you see, we, we may have the right message, but do we have the right kind of life, you know? So, so she walked away pretty disappointed. And I said, you know, nobody's perfect. And, uh, uh, and, and that's a, a pretty good as- assessment. I, I hope that's not what she finds when she comes to our church. Hopefully we can do a little better by living out some things, right? Some of, our, some of the words uh, the Bible teaches us. Today we're, the, the topic is called human standards. Uh, human standards, and it's from John chapter 8, verse 12 through 20. What are human standards? The things of, the, the standards of this world the human relation standards and, and the way we kind of conduct ourselves and the way we, re, uh, we interact with one another. And, uh, you know, we've been talking about this concept of judging 
judging. Uh, every day we make judgment calls. Every day we make that determination what is right and what is wrong. And, and, and oftentimes it's, uh, it's, uh, it's wrong. We make the wrong judgment call. You know? How, how, how do you make that right judgment? Um, because it, it, what makes it right? What makes it, if everything is subjective, then, then th there shouldn't be any objective truth. You know? But it, what if there is an objective truth? Then we need to know that. We need to know what that is. So you can't, you can't just depend on your own personal experience. You can't, you can't depend on the society standards. You, you can't depend on church tradition because, see, these things change. They all change. If you look at our church today and, and, and a church 50 years ago, the, these traditions are very different. I mean, listen to our music today. Come on, how many of you enjoy music this morning? Yeah, I enjoy the music, right? All right, so if you look at our, our worship, the, the music that we play 50 years ago, it's very different, drastically different. And if we continue to hold on to certain traditions and, and use our tradition to judge what we do today, I think we'd be... <laughs> we'd be off. We'd be really off. You can't do that. We can't use the, you know, the earthly, the, the societal standards to, to make judgment calls in life because just because there's more people agree on the same thing, does that make it necessarily right or better? I mean, I, I was using this example. I, I think it's an easier example for, for, for an Asian culture. But, but, but you guys come from a very, very American, more American culture, okay? So, so well, I, I hope this might, might ring with you. See, all of us believe in democracy. Right? We, we believe democracy is a high virtue. My question to you is, is it? Is it? I mean, we grew up with it. I mean, we kind of brought, brought up an environment where we exalt freedom of man. But what if you have a society where, where the people are not educated and they're not ready to take on responsibility? What if they have no character, no virtue within the people? Would you want the people to rule? Think about that. And because we're propagating democracy across the globe and assuming democracy is something that, that is such a high virtue. But the truth is, it's only a form of government, isn't it? It's a form of government. And how is it better than another? What makes democracy supreme is when you have a, a people that is rooted on some very valuable truth that makes these people stand out and democracy shines. But what if you have a whole bunch of hoodlums, okay? People that don't care about other people who takes no responsibility for the actions and you want them to rule? What's gonna happen? Chaos. Chaos. And that's what we, that's what we find when we, when we take democracy to certain parts of the world and people are not ready for democracy and guess what happened? Whew, craziness in some parts of the world. So we can't take our personal experience, we can't take the values necessary of the society, we can't take church, even church traditions. And, and, and when we make these determinations, we have to be very careful. Why? Because don't, don't be that person that, that cast the first stone at another person. What does that mean? That, that's what we talked about last week, right? Because the, the, the experience, a lot of times, is so easy to rout up a crowd. It is so easy to get everybody, the, the mob, together and, and start critiquing someone or, or, or judging someone and then so easy to pick up a, a piece of rock and cast it at somebody else. See, why do we need to be careful? Why do we need to be careful not to demonize someone just because the crowd is motivated? Just when we're riled up, we can do a lot of damage without thinking. See, mobs cannot be responsible for their behavior because there's no thoughts behind it. If there's a lot of passion. Oh, that person needs to be stoned to death. Be careful to cast that first stone because you may be bringing judgment upon yourself for what you're doing. And that's what happens in our world today. In our daily life, we have a, a lot of uh, decisions to make. 
You know, some of you are professionals, some of you are business folks, some, some of you are, are students. Every day you have decisions to make. How do you make those judgments? Very, very important decisions for your life. And how about in church, in ministry? We have to make decisions all the time about what to do and how to evaluate things. If somebody comes to your life, you have to make a decision saying, can I trust that person? Turn, turn to the person next to you and say, can I trust you? Yeah, can I trust you? Can, what, 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 do you what do you base it on? Just because we hang out, we have a good time, we can have boba together and everybody's pretty cool? Is that, is that enough to, for you to trust that person? Okay, what, what makes that person trustworthy? These are all decisions we have to make. All right? So, let's pray one more time, and we'll get, get started with the passage, okay? Father God, I just want to pray that you humble us as we look into your words right now. Will your spirit shape us in such a way that we conform to your will and your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, the passage is chapter 8 of John. And uh, anybody in the back, back of the computer know? If not, then we'll just use our own Bible. Chapter 8, verse 12 through 13 first. We're going to read 12 through 13. And this is right after this experience where Jesus was, was, to, uh, was placed in that position to, to whether to judge this woman uh, who was found uh, caught in adultery uh, or not do, you, do we do we want to stone her because that's what the law of Moses says okay this is what happened right afterwards verse 12 13 if you have your Bible would you turn and uh, read with me okay chapter 12 uh, chapter excuse me chapter 8 verse 12 and 13 when Jesus spoke again to the people he said I am the light of the world whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life. The Pharisees challenged them, Where are, uh, here, we, here you are appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Okay, this happened 2,000 years ago. Jesus is a traveling rabbi, and, uh, and these Pharisees have been kind of like pastors or theologians in their day, pastors and theologians, and they've been uh, leaders of the church during the time 2,000 years ago and Jesus came along and te started teaching something they thought was radical okay was unusual teaching and he started talking about I am the light of this world you know uh, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life and they say how can I trust you how can you, I trust you? I mean, today we take it for granted. We believe Jesus is the Son of God. We, we kind of grew up in a culture. We, we believe He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. But there's a whole bunch of people in His day that didn't believe that. They didn't know Jesus. Who's Jesus? Just another name. Because, you know, Jesus, like Jesus in Spanish, is a pretty common name. Hello? Okay? It's pretty common. In fact, His name in Hebrew would have been Yeshua. Joshua, all right, the same name. Jesus and Joshua is the same word in, in, in Hebrew, all right? It, and the word means God saves. Very common name. So what's the big deal about Jesus coming into town, all right? Why do we need to trust you? Why do we need to believe in you? So they have to make that determination. And, and the religious leaders in his day didn't want to trust him. Did not want to trust him a bit, Okay? And so, Jesus started teaching about light and darkness. See, here is a whole bunch of people coming together and they made a judgment and say, we can't trust Jesus. We can't trust Jesus. Even though he's teaching about light and darkness, they don't believe him. They want him to make, kind of prove to them that he is worthy of trust. How can I trust you? You know, Neil, how can I trust you? You got some teaching, you got some radical thoughts. How can I trust you? You're giving your own testimony. I can't trust you. 
A lot of times we need to make determination because there is a crowd behind us. There is a crowd. There's people. But Jesus wants us to talk about how do you live? How do you live your life? Here he makes a determination. There is light. There is darkness. There is light because you walk in the light. There is darkness because you walk in darkness. How does a person walk in light? Well, Jesus exemplified that. Jesus lived in the light. You know why? Because everywhere he went, he taught in the public. He had nothing to hide. He wasn't trying to create a movement behind everybody's back. Are you with me? He's not creating a caucus. You know, he's not creating his own kind of uh, uh, little groupie and say, "I'm creating a Jesus groupie here, guys, and, and, and these guys, nobody else should come in, and just just us." Okay, and. and he, and he's always done it publicly. But what do you think these Pharisees, they, they were doing? What, what do you think they were doing? They were they're having these secret meetings. If you read chapter 7, they were having these secret meetings where they gather those leaders and say, Okay, can we talk about Jesus? Let's talk about Jesus. And, and what he's done. Is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? They're, they're kind of like talking within themselves and, and, and these secret meetings and then once they make some deci decision they go out into the public and try to provoke the public to response the, the whole scheme of bringing out this adulterous woman in front of Jesus for Jesus to be caught in their trap was was a scheme they prepared in in darkness Do you see that Jesus was trying to point out to the way you behave. How can you trust someone when they, all they do is all these secret schemes every day? Just, just thinking about ways how to take down other people. When Jesus lives openly, he says, I have nothing to hide. Come, you, um, all my attackers, accusers, go. What do you have against me? You know, that's how Jesus lived. If you live in the light, there's nothing to hide, my friends. And, and some of you may want to think about how to live in the light more. I, I, I don't know the choices you make every day, but I, I do know that there is a difference between living in the dark versus living in the light. When you live in the light, there is no guilt, there is no shame. Because you know it's exposed. And some of you, you may have some secret side of your life you don't want anybody to see. Okay? Now, I, I don't know what you do, but are you watching certain shows on the internet? When somebody walks in, all of a sudden you have to change channel. Okay? That's darkness. Or are you talking about someone behind somebody else's back? And when that person shows up, right away, you, st you stop whatever you're doing. See, the life of darkness creates anxiety. The life of darkness creates discord among people, and, and people cannot trust one another. So how do we make determination what kind of life to live? Jesus gave us introduction. Light and darkness. Determining life from darkness is not an exercise of numbers. It's a choice of life. It's a choice of life. And don't be like the Pharisees. As much as they understand the Bible, as much as they understand the, the law, but they don't understand the heart of God. They don't understand the heart of God. Okay, so why don't we uh, go to verse 14 through 15, okay? 14 through 15, would you scroll that up a little bit? Oh, you had to do it every time. Okay. One, four. No? Doesn't work? <laughs> All right. Let's go to 14 through uh, 14 to 15, okay? Jesus answered, Even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, for I know where I came from or where I'm going. But you have no idea where I come from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. All right, so, so Jesus, what do you think Jesus is alluding to? Uh, someone who knows where they come from, where they're going, 
Someone who knows where they come from and where they're going is someone who knows about what their life is all about. You know? Do you know where you come from, where you're going? A lot of people don't, don't think about that. But, but these are what essential questions everybody must ask. If you don't know where you come from, where you're going, oh, there's very dangerous people that don't know where they come from, where they're going. Are you with me? If you don't know what kind of values that brings you into this world, what the goals you have here on this planet, in this life, where are you going to end up? Okay? If you don't know, it's very dangerous because your choices that you make can, can be all, all different possibilities. But if you know where you come from, you know your roots, you know where you're going to go. And this life is consistent. See? Those are very important questions. So Jesus says, I know where, I'm come, where I come from and where I'm going. So, and, and Jesus is critiquing these people the way they judge people. He said, I, I know where I'm from. I live my life. This is the life that I live. And you don't know where I'm coming from or where I'm going, but don't, you know, you're judging me. See, don't you ever, don't you feel bad when people kind of put you in a box and the first time they, they look at you, they already have an impression of you and they said, that's just so-and-so. They right away put you in a corner, in a box, sometimes stereotypical places, you know, and, and without understanding you. They don't know where you're from. They don't know your story right away. They know who you are. You like that? How do you feel? Because that's how people judge each other. People have that, that you know, judgment. They, they look at your appearance and right away what you wear and, and how you behave, they, they right away put you in a box. But Jesus says, you got to know where you're from and where you're going. Do you, do you know me? Turn to the person next to you and say, do you know me? Do you know me? Uh, I, I think when you, when you ask that question, it can be very dangerous because you may be inviting that person to tell you a whole story, right? <laughs> they're going to tell you where they're coming from, you know, where they're going, what is the value of their life, what they're doing, you know, what they're doing now. Uh, but if you're really interested, if you're really interested, I, I think you may develop a deep relationship right there. You may really get to know that person. Okay? And you find out what that person is all about. But most of us, as we go through life, everybody that we meet are only in passing. The people come in and out of your life. We really don't spend the time to get to know them. Come on, right? And some, some people in our lives are just tools. Ah, look at Josh. Josh is great at uh, saxophone, huh? Piano and everything. We can use him, right? You, you know what I'm talking about? So a lot of times, people become tools in our lives, uh, and, and, and then we don't treat them like people. We don't treat them as precious, valuable things. If you don't know where he's from, you don't know what's about. Only you can see is from what on the outside. And the word here, the, the word Jesus used in NIV translated, you judge by human standards. But the original Greek, it says, actually you judge by flesh. Human standards. See, because the human standards, and in the human way of doing things, we judge them by flesh. Flesh is our weakness, all right? I judge people by our, my weakness because I see things the way I want to see people. I see things, I see people sometimes because this is how I see myself. Okay? And, and sometimes... I doubt people because I actually doubt myself. Are you with me? I, I question people's integrity because I actually question my own integrity. Are you with me? All right, so, so I, I look at everybody and say, you know what, that person looks suspicious because I think that person would be stealing from me. And you, the reason you think that way is because if you act that way yourself, you know you have that tendency. Are you with me? 
So, so when we judge people by the flesh, we're actually judging people based on our own inclinations and the weaknesses and the flesh in our hearts and the evil that is inside. See, that's why we use that the word is, is you're judging people in an evil way. Because you're using your own evil to judge another person and based on that, that person is valuable or not. It's coming from that evil stance. In a, in a Chinese culture, um, there, there's an expression that you look down on people. You look down on people, uh, basically the way they express it is by you, you're looking at from the bottom of the door. You let the little crack on the bottom. See, see, the way you look at a person from the bottom of the door, there's a little crack and everybody seems to be flat. Everybody seems to be flat. What does that mean? It's like every time you're looking at another person, you, you make them small. You're making them small. Why? Either you want to boast yourself so that they can, they're smaller or that you don't think you're, you're that big yourself. You're really small yourself and therefore you consider other people small. See, that's from the flesh. What is the flesh? Flesh is the appearance. Flesh is second-guessing another person. You're always doubting whether or not that person comes with a good intention. And then there's a lot of fear, maybe anger, and maybe jealousy. For years, for years I've always uh, carried envy. In fact, that's one of my, my biggest, biggest sins is Pride and envy, they usually come together. Pride and envy. Okay? Huh? What is it? They're brothers. They're brothers. Pride and envy, they come together. See, I, I, when I was 18 years old, I, I want to be, be successful. I, I want to be the best I can be. And so that, that's why, well, actually it began much before that. But, but then when I was 18, I started my first business. Some of you heard about that. And then one of my pet peeves was... I like to know how successful other people are and I want to compete. I want to see how I can be better than they are. Do you know the problem with that? What is the problem with that? The problem with that is that every time you hear about someone who's doing more successful than you are, envy burns, burn. And then you have to find excuses for them how bad they are. You have to find reasons to make them look bad in your own mind so you can justify how good you are. Do you, do you know that's not the heart of God? Hello? Are you with me? Do you understand that's not the heart of God? That's not what, how to live your life? That is such a horrible way to live. Every day you're comparing yourself with other people. Every day you're competing. Uh, some people will say, oh, this is good. This is kind of make you grow, make you strong. I can tell you it rots your core, rots your soul away inside, deep inside. Okay? Just because you're envious, just because you're proud, um, why would that be bad? Oh, I, I, I can tell you, my friends, that's not how you want to live. I, I've learned my lesson. I, I learned it the hard way. You, you have to meet God to realize what humility is. A lot of people know God in their mind, you know, I, I know who God is, but you know, never encounter God. If you truly encounter God, you learn humility right away, pretty fast. And when you learn humility, all those things of pride and envy and those things will slowly fade away. They don't go away in an instant, but they do go away slowly. But there's a lot of work of cleansing that's necessary. A lot of cleansing that's necessary. So my friends, ju judge not a book by its cover. Just don't judge people from the outside. Don't judge people from your own flesh. All right? Look at their life. Whether or not they have a testimony. See, Jesus came from God, came from heaven. So what kind of life does he live? Yeah, he lives eternal life. Eternal life is not just about living for a long time. He, he brought the quality of life, the eternal quality of life into this life and lived in hope, in beauty, in power. All right? That's the kind of life we want to live. 
Jesus know where he comes from and where he's going? I, I, I want to challenge you to think about how do you judge another person whether or not this person can be trusted? I want you to get to know that person's family. I want you to get to know that person's friends. Okay? Does that person have a good family? Okay? How, did, how, how do you think this person is in front of his friends? Is he accepted? How about his workplace? Does he have good work ethics? Or, or when he goes to work, everybody hates him. You know, this person is a horrible worker. You know? What kind of worker is he? What kind of testimony does he have? That's a, te a person's testimony is his, his life. Don't judge a person based on flesh. Judge a person, look at that life. Look at their spiritual life. Okay, let's look at verse 16 together. Look, uh, look at 16. Verse 16 says, But if I do judge, my decisions are true. Because I am not alone, I stand with the Father who sent me. Um, I, I think here is the secret ingredient. Uh, how many of you have a secret sauce that you really, really just, just love? Anybody? How, how many of you, your secret sauce is uh, sriracha? You, you put that in everything, no? No? Some, some of you use soy sauce? Well, what, what do you have? Hawaiian barbecue sauce, okay. <laughs> That's awesome, all right. Somebody have a secret sauce. What is that secret sauce? Well, here is the kind of secret sauce to making the right decision in life. Okay? What do you think this is? Jesus is saying, if you partner up with God in all your decision making, you can be right every time. You can be right every time. You know, some of you, when you encounter very challenging circumstances, you go to God and say, God, please help me make this decision. And you don't hear anything. Why? You know why you don't hear anything? Do you think God hears you? Come on. Right? Yeah, God listens to every prayer, right? How come when you ask God on those very difficult circumstances in life, you don't hear Him? Because timing, okay? I can tell you. Because regularly, you don't go to God. If you don't listen to God regularly, who do you listen to? You listen to yourself and everybody else around. And if you don't, if you don't hear God on a regular basis because you listen to the world, how easy is it to listen to God? Because you're following at a distance. You can't hear God. The problem with a lot of people going to God in these those very crucial times in life is because they don't, they're not following Jesus. They're not following the Spirit on a regular basis. And so all they're used to listen are, are, the, are the noises around us. Wah, 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 wah. Everybody, people around you are making noises. And, and that's all you hear. You don't hear what God is saying. And that is the problem. That is a real problem. And the, how do you hear God? By spending time with Him on a regular basis. It's just like a friend. If you talk to this person all the time, you don't even need to ask that person. What do you think? You already know what that person thinks. Are you with me? But the problem with, with us is that we only go to God during very difficult, challenging times. And so, every time you make a decision, you should be asking this. God, is this your heart? Most often time we do this. This is our prayer. I already made a decision, God. I want you to bless it. This is my, you know, I, I want to do it this way. I want you to be in it. Oh, God, please be in my life. Okay? So whose life is it? It's your own life. And show down. <laughs> it's your life. And, and guess what? And, and you just want God to bless it. And you're not, you're not partnering with the Lord. Our, our theme this year is to be in step with the Spirit. How do you stay in step with the Spirit? Every step of the way, God has a heart for you. He has a, a, a beautiful intention for you to live out. But are you partnering with Him? Let's go to verse 17 and 18. All right. 
Bible says, in your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am one who testifies of myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. Here, Jesus is saying the Father is testifying for him. Jesus used his own life as a testimony, but the Father is also testifying for him. What do you think he's, he's talking about? How do you think the Father is making testimonies for him? Every miracle, every sign and wonder that Jesus performed is a testimony that the Father is there with him. You see that? And besides, over 300 prophecies are fulfilled on Jesus in his own life from the Old Testament. All right? How do we know that the Father and you are together? Every time, my friends, every time we go on a mission trip, every time we follow God's heart and His ways, there always you can see His fingerprints everywhere. You can see His heart expressed everywhere. You can see Him showing up. Testimonies. I mean, even when I didn't have enough faith to perform miracles, but He shows up. When I pray for someone, people get healed. I say, ooh, I'm surprised. I'm surprised. Why? Because God shows up. He is testifying that He's there with me. And there are just so many circumstances through life that He shows up. The Bible, what the Bible says is true. Whenever you obey Him and live out His decrees, He's there with you. Whenever you do things by faith, He put a stamp of approval and shows that I'm here. I'm with you. So, Jesus is there. Jesus testified. And uh, the Father will testify with you wherever you go. All right? And here is the, uh, the last of uh, today's passage, verse 19 through 20. All right? Read it with me. Then they asked him, Where is your father? You, you do not know me or my father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were, were put. Yet no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. See, knowing the Father is knowing the one he sent. How do we know if someone was sent by God? How do we know? If you know the Father's heart, you will see that heart expressed in that person. Do you see that? Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, how do we know that Beatrice was sent by God? <laughs> how do we know? How do we know if Pastor James Cho was sent by God? How do we know if Cindy and Thomas were sent by God? How do we know? You, if you know the heart of God, you know. If you know the heart of God. When, when, the, when the heart of God <laughs> is expressed in another person's life, and you meet that person, if, if you're, you have the heart of God, and together, as they come together, the fire just begin to come out. It's amazing. It's an amazing experience when, when people of God come together and there's just the confirmation from your heart. Amen? And that heart is a heart of freedom. That heart is a heart of service. That heart is a heart of love. And so how do we know someone is sent by God? We know because you are connected with the Father and that person is connected by the, with the Father and we come together. You may not, you may, uh, may not have to agree on everything, but when you do connect, Father, Father's heart is, is pleased. It's completed. So, Jesus asked, you know, these people, do you know my Father? Do you know my father? You will not know me if you don't know my father. And the way you can tell I'm from the father is because you know the father. So I can tell you right now, not everybody is going to recognize you. Not everybody is going to recognize you from the Lord. But, but if they're from the Lord themselves, they'll recognize you. They'll recognize you. Okay? How do we know someone is sent by God? All right, today... Um, I just want to remind us from the word that we should not be trusting the human standards. There, there, there are these biblical spiritual standards to go by. 
we determine light from darkness, not, not from numbers, not from the people's ways, but we look at how this person lived their life, whether or not they live in light or they live in darkness. And we don't judge a person by the cover, by the appearance. We, we look at their testimony. What kind of testimony? Do they have joy? Or, or do they, they live in bitterness all the time? That's right. It could be jealousy, yeah? People have jealousy. When you have too much fun, they, 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 have, they have a problem. Your church is too much fun. <laughs> do, do you know that uh, people have problem with us dancing in the church? Some people think we have too much fun. Or, and, and there's a problem. Okay? See, we, we need to make this determinations in life in partnership with God. And I, I, I want to challenge us, every one of us today, to make Jesus your priority. And what do I mean by that is, make Jesus your priority. Every time you have to make a decision, whether big or small, it doesn't matter. Just go to Jesus first. Say, God, what is your heart in this matter? What do you want me to do? Okay? How should I look at this situation? I think that's, that's a challenge. Because a lot of times we just want to do it ourselves. Do our own ways. No more human standards. Do it God's way. Walking with Him. Okay? You're walking with Him, you have to be in partnership with Him. That means... Where do you want to go, Jesus? So instead of walking on your own and say, Jesus, come and follow me. Come follow me. <laughs> if you want to be in step with the Spirit, say, Jesus, where should I take my next step? All right. After a while, you know how to waltz with Jesus. Come on. You want to dance with him, right? You don't want to constantly step on his foot. <laughs> so let us pray.